you know, I'm one of those folks who, who likes to know where I'm going. My company, we had projections. We knew what we were going to spend on capital. We did the same thing with our city. We did the same thing with our state. So we developed the CAP Act. It's a 10-page bill. It's simple. It doesn't have a lot of whereases in it. It just is like a business plan for the United States. It is in legislative language, so it's something that is ready to be passed. But it does... It does four things. Number one, it puts a cap on spending. Dan mentioned that we were at 25% of GDP. Maybe we're at 24.5% today. This is the highest level spending relative to our economy that we have been since 1945 in this country, the highest level since 1945. So uh, what is it we need to do? To me, what we need to do is cap spending and then drive it down to what I would call the 40-year historical average. And you might say, well, why did you pick the 40-year historical average? I want to pass a bill, okay? I don't want to message. I believe that this crisis and spending is real. I'm concerned about our country. I don't think we have many years to do what needs to be done. And so what is unreasonable with driving spending levels down to the post-entitlement 40-year average. It seems to me that people on both sides of the aisle ought to be able to support that type of glide path. So this bill puts us on that glide path. It has benchmarks that are laid out. It has a formula that drives you to that every year prior to budget negotiations needing to take place. In other words, that target is projected out in advance so that the appropriations committees and others involved have the ability to drive towards that number. We, we look at the, average, the GDP on a multi-year averaging basis. We take three years into account. So if you have one year that's odd, you don't have volatility in your targeting. That's something that the federal government is not able to cope with. It's very difficult to even do that on a state basis, but certainly not at the federal level. And then here is the piece that is maybe the most important. It puts in place something called sequestration. If we do not meet the benchmarks that are laid out, OMB, and this is constitutionally an okay thing to do, we've met with constitutional scholars, OMB comes out based on a formula, not based on their judgment, based on a formula, and begins extracting money out of every area of government, okay? This will be the first time that I know of that we will look at every piece of government spending, including entitlements. In other words, right now you see us fighting, you know that we are taking in $2.2 trillion this year, and you know that we are spending $3.7 trillion this year, and you know that if we did away with all defense spending and all non-defense discretionary spending, we still would not balance the budget. Still wouldn't balance it. You can do away with all of that, and we wouldn't balance the budget. So the fact is that the only way we're going to deal with the issues that are in front of us is for everything to be on budget. All the entitlement programs, everything would be on budget. And if we did not redesign those programs and do the other things that were necessary to meet these caps, money would be sequestered out of accounts. That is something no senator, no congressman wants to do. But without teeth like that, there's almost no way that Congress is going to have the courage to do the things that it needs to do. And then you have the ability to override that with a two-thirds waiver. Uh, again, something that you can legislate. Uh, obviously, there are ways, there are some ways of getting around that, but this is the strongest piece of legislation that we feel we can put in place. Let's go to the next slide. So what does it do? It caps spending relative to our economy takes us to a place that has been our 40-year average. This, if you look at most, uh, most people on the Hill, look at what's called the CBO alternative fiscal scenario. That's a CBO by baseline, but also assumptions that are what people think is really going to happen, okay? For instance, for years we've talked about the AMT tax kicking in at certain levels, but we always kick it down the road. We look at SGR on Medicare. Uh, we never actually incorporate it. So the alternative fiscal scenario is what most people focus on to look at where spending is really going to be. The CAP Act, if it's put in place, will cause us to spend $7.6 trillion less 
over a 10-year period than current policy. That is a lot of spending. And the way you have to do that, as you know, you all know the difference between one-time spending and one-time cuts and recurring cuts. Recurring cuts are those kind that go all the way through the budget, okay? They just keep on going. What this would force us to do is redesign almost every area of government, and we'd have to begin doing that next year because this would kick in in the fiscal year 2013. The interesting thing is you saw the chart a minute ago that takes us from 63 percent to the number that was stratospheric over a 20-year period. At the end of 10 years, instead of seeing that happen, where we would be is at 64 percent debt to GDP, and each, there, each year thereafter, we'd be driving that number down. So to me, this is something that is statutorily able to be done. Mike Lee, which will come in in a minute, talking about the constitutional amendment, typically it takes two years to get a constitutional amendment passed throughout the country. That's been the average, if you can get it to pass Congress. The particular one that I think he is going to be talking about then has a five-year kick-in after that. That's seven years. You have to do something in the interim statutorily to begin driving down costs Otherwise, you have a seven-year period of time where you really haven't taken the action that needs to be taken. Let's go to the next slide. A lot of people have asked, well, you know, how does this compare to other plans? Uh, this is the Obama plan, okay? And that is that in 10 years, we're going to be at 26.8 percent spending relative to GDP, which is just absolutely stratospheric. You're talking trillions of dollars. The blue line, uh, you remember the Ryan Roadmap where Paul Ryan has caught unbelievable grief about laying something out through the year 2055 that was, absolutely, you know, that was at least thoughtful and laid out ways of how to deal with, uh, with excessive spending. At the end of 10 years, Paul Ryan, under the roadmap that he developed about a year and a half ago, got down to 22.6 percent, okay? The President's Deficit Commission, which is still meeting, I think you know there's a gang of six, three on each side, that is looking at trying to, to agree on that and then create some legislative language around it. At the end of 10 years, they get down to 21.8 percent, and obviously the CAP Act, which I'm outlining right now, takes us down to 20.6. I've had numbers of conversations with Paul Ryan. I think all of you know he's put forth a what I would consider a, just an outstanding service to our country to lay out um, what can be done. It's interesting to note that in 2022, under this newest plan that he's just laid out, he gets down to 20.25% spending relative to GDP. So the point is that if you put in place the CAP Act to force us to take those kinds of actions. There's at least one plan that's been laid out already that shows a pathway to do that. But this to me, uh, let me go back to 20.6%. I want to pass a bill. I don't want to pass a bill for the sake of passing a bill. I want to pass a bill because I'm, I'm really concerned. I watch what we do on the Hill. I see incredible lack of discipline. I see, instead of Places that I've been used to where, let's say as a mayor, what do you want to do the first year you get there? You want to make all the tough choices you can make, right? And just go ahead and write the ship immediately. As Commissioner of Finance for our state, what do you want to do? You want to write the ship immediately. As a business person, you come into a tr troubled company, what do you want to do? You immediately make those changes that are necessary to make sure the company is on the right path. Around here, what do we do? We wait and wait and wait hoping, hoping somehow that the real issue will be dealt with after we're gone or after our election cycle is over. So the only way to create the kind of urgency that we need in Congress to be responsible, to be courageous, to deal with everything in the budget so we can actually close that gap I was talking about, to me, is to have something in place like the CAP Act. I need 13 Democrats if every Republican voted for it, right? In the, House, in the Senate, you need 60 votes. I think our opportunity to change the direction of spending in our country is on the debt limit vote. I really believe it. I know that people have said that it's irresponsible to not vote for a debt ceiling increase because it's, it's like running up a credit card tab and then not paying the bill. 
And the fact is, Congress is spending the money, and the analogy is semi-correct. I have come to the conclusion after being here four years that it's irresponsible not to be responsible prior to a debt ceiling vote, okay? And to me, we've got to have some kind of fiscal straitjacket put on Washington or this will never end. So I'm hoping that sometime prior to the debt ceiling vote or maybe simultaneously, the CAP Act becomes law. I have two Democrats as co-sponsors. One's announced, one's unannounced. It has tremendous momentum on the Republican side. We've obviously spent a lot of time talking to Ryan and others. We're working daily to educate people about the need for this. And again, wouldn't it make sense for a body that has 100 senators and 435 congressmen that tend to bicker, 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 wouldn't it be interesting to first, to first agree where we're going, first agree what the game plan is, and then let the debate begin.